Bernathan College and for our first of our uh, series of distinguished speakers for this year. I'm so pleased that so many of you turned out in a very uh, stormy evening and with lots of other competing activities. So tonight I'd like to do an introduction to Mr. Steve David. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. David as tonight's featured distinguished speaker. And before Stephen joins us, I would like to share a little background on him. Stephen graduated from the Academy of the New Church Boys School in 1978 and went on to attend Bernathan College. From there, he went on to finish his undergraduate degree in economics and political science at Yale University. And some years later, he obtained an MBA from the University of Pittsburgh. Stephen and his wife Caroline reside in Pittsburgh and they have raised their four children in the Pittsburgh New Church. Three of his children attended Bernathan College. On the professional side, Stephen is the president and CEO of Skymark Corporation, a Pittsburgh-based software company that he co-founded with Dr. Steve Heilman in 1992. Skymark specializes in the development of custom software and website creation for businesses and nonprofit clients. For the past few years, Stephen has been leading the development of the New Christian Bible Study Project. This is a global program that uses web and search technology that serves as an online clearinghouse for people who are interested in the Bible, but not just in the literal sense, but also in its inner spiritual sense revealed through the writings of Swedenborg. New Christian Bible study has Sorry, my mic's um, dropped out. New Christian Bible Study has become one of the largest new church-related websites, having achieved a rapid growth from a launch just six years ago to today they have a run rate of more than three million visitors per year. What's more, in creating the site, Steve's team of web developers have also built a set of tools that help ministers, teachers, translators, students and researchers locate translations and cross-references to subjects found in the writings, the Bible, and countless sources of other media, such as articles, sermons, academic papers, and even videos from off the left eye. Due to the extraordinary effort made by Stephen and his team, the New Christian Bible Study has become a strategic partner with Bernathan College and the Swedenborg's Foundation Off the Left Eye program as it spreads ideas of the New Christian Church to millions of site visitors. To tell you more about this project, I'm pleased to welcome Steve David to the college. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Brian. That's a good intro, and, and um, I'll fill in some of the details. Um, I see Dan Sinis out there in the audience. So when I was, when I was a, a kid growing up in Franklin, Pennsylvania, um, we used to go over to North Ohio for the North Ohio Circle once a month. And um, there were Sinis Fets and Heinrichs and Powell's and Domains and Weedingers and Hunsakers and all sorts of nice people. Um, that was a that was a that was a good thing. Mostly we had home church, and um, I think that was a good thing too, because my dad was he was a serious Swedenborgian, and he made us think, and he wanted us to ask him questions, and and um, so <laughs> I can actually remember him. We we had to sometimes, you know, as we got older, take a turn reading a sermon or something like that, and I remember. Um, cutting one of Dan Goodnow's sermons down by about half. Dan, if you're online listening, I'm, I apologize. But um, the, uh, and my dad thought it was really, really cheeky of me to, and it was, to, you know, to do that. Um, anyway, I, I want to show you, well, let's, let's just dive right in here. Um, so I need to turn this on. And it's on. Good. Okay. So, sort of a quiz. You read the word. 
Or why do you read the Word, really? What's, give me a motive for why you might go read the Word. You want to know the Lord. How about another one? Comfort. Comfort. Yeah, that was one that occurred to me. Another one? <laughs> that occurred to me too. Yeah, I agree. Jay? Yes, yes, exactly. So these, these are the kinds of answers that people give when, when you ask this question. They're looking for help. They want to do better. They, want, they know they should, even if they don't know quite why. They know there's something there that they need. Um, so if you're in the new church, you know there's an internal sense to the word. And um, I'm going to show you how you do, how you research the internal sense. You guys probably all know this, but um, I think it's kind of interesting to, to, to watch it for a second. So, and I don't mean any disrespect. I know this is the way, when, when all you have is books, this is how you have to do it. And this is how we have had to do it for a couple of centuries. So, you're reading the Word and open to Judges. It's a chapter about Jephthah and, and the men of Ephraim having a war or a battle. And you read it and you think, you know, why? Why? What is sacred about this? It just, there's nothing in there that speaks to you at all. So, so if you're doing the research, and there are an awful lot of clergymen in here, so... <laughs> Okay, but you know, you go to go to Searle's index and you say, "All right, flip through," and there are only three references to Judges 12. There are two Arcana references and one to Apocalypse Explained. So you would probably look those up, and you would go, "I brought these from Pittsburgh, okay?" Because this this is and. Elliot, I don't know where Potts translation, but I have my Elliot translation, and I could find that passage. And typically, on the average, if you find one passage, it will have about three other references. So you would start with those three. You might explode to nine, and you could easily go, you know, to twenty-seven and etc. Um, so pretty soon, you have a couple of arcanas open, and you have. Apocalypse Explained, and you find the right volume, and you find it, and that, those are long numbers. It takes you a while to find the citation in the number, right? And you're starting to get a glimmer, maybe, of what the internal sense of that story is with Jephthah and the Ephraimites. But then you go to Seacrest, Dictionary of Bible Imagery. You've probably seen this cover, right? And um, you look up Jephthah, and, and if you're lucky, you'll find out what Jephthah means, and Ephraim. And you can start to pick, you know, fit these pieces together. And you really should be making notes because, you know, it's, it's a serious business. So a couple of hours later, you might have an idea of what the internal sense of that story is. And, um, and it's, it's cool, it's scholarly. You, uh, you know, I love books, and, you know, it's like, I'm a scholar, I got all these books open, it's great. But it's, it's, is George McCurdy here? No? He, he wanted me to point out, because I'm going to say this is slow and awkward and difficult and actually impossible for some people, but he wanted me to also point out that it's rewarding. And that is true. It is rewarding. And that's why the new church has, you know, there's been tremendous scholarship. The, the scholarship that went into the production of this is is... It's staggering, really, when you look at it. It's just it's like, wow, how did those guys do that? Um, not just guys, either. Old study notes jump right out at you. And Alice Spear Seacrest was a scholar. And so it's a, it's, there's a great, you know, we're standing on shoulders of people that did a lot of really neat work. Um, if you're really ambitious, you would find the Book of Commentary on the Book of Judges, which I don't happen to have in my portable library. But, um, you know, there is a lot of commentary. And you could find that too. So, so if... Oh, and I forgot about the concordance. If you find something in the writings that you're interested in, but you want to, um, you know, you want to 
see where else it's talking about it, you get out your concordance and you find those and you go to those. So that's researching the internal sense of Judges 12. And it's, it's neat, but let me jump back to here for a minute. So that's the historical method. And so take a wild guess. How many people, how many sets of those do you think exist in the world today? I don't know the answer, but just guess. What would you think? I'll bet that's high. I don't know. She said 10,000. Any five? A thousand? Five thousand? Yeah, maybe five. <laughs> no, but no. Full sets, maybe a thousand. Maybe. I don't have Boggs Glossary. I, you know, I, and I collect stuff like this. So it's, um, so if there are a thousand sets of this and there are 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, what percent of people have a chance to read the real internal sense? Vanishingly small, or at least it was. Um, and, it, and it's actually worse, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, so it hasn't been easy, it hasn't been accessible. How many Bible readers do you suppose there are in the world? It's, it's probably more than a billion. Um, there are a couple billion Christians. I don't know how many of them are Bible readers, but um, the biggest Bible study websites get um, uh, 150 million visits a month, kind of, un yeah, that kind of thing. And we're getting 3 million, so, or no, we're getting 3 million a year. We're getting 260,000 a month. So they're still 800 times bigger than we are. But, um, you know, it's less than three orders of magnitude, so we're getting there. <laughs> the, uh, so why do those people read the Bible? Same reason we do. Um, they, and they, it's interesting because they know, most people, I think, know that there's an internal sense. And, um, you know, the, the doctrine of genuine truth, and they, uh, sometimes it appears, and it's very evident, and other times, it's so symbolic that you know Adam and Eve must stand for something because, because you know, why else? Um, so, so there is that perception that it's there. I think the new church has this, this compelling, unique uh, advantage, which is the internal sense. And uh, if we want to reach those Bible readers, we have... Um, we have a really, really valuable thing that they want. And if we can connect that, the people in languages for just a minute. So seven plus billion people here, 7.2, so around 500 million max speak English as a native language. Um, Six billion people don't speak English at all. And so go back to this, this idea for a second. How many of the, how many of the non English speakers have access to the minimum Swedenborg library? It's, it's basically zero. The, there's no Searle's index, no dictionary, there's no, there's no commentary. Almost you know maybe three people maybe maybe five it's it's it's, it's embarrassing really um, almost catastrophic uh, okay <laughs> that's right we, we, don't, we probably don't want to stake the whole thing on Latin do we I mean we love Latin Lisa but um, okay, so for a billion people, the tools just don't exist. For another 1.7 billion, 1.69999 billion, they're not available. They don't have them. I mean, they're available, but 
they're not in their possession. So we could either print 300 billion books and give everybody a couple of rolling duffel bags full of, full of books, or we could put it all online, and then you could have it in your smartphone. And so we decided to put you could have your smartphone, your computer. Um, it's a no-brainer. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears a little bit because um, we've had the writings online for a while. You guys probably you've probably seen New Search or you've seen Grandman, um, and Ian Thompson's had a neat site, and there've been a bunch of bunch of efforts, but they. Uh, And, and the Kempton project too, but they haven't taken off. So I want to explore that a little bit. Um, so the Douglas DC-3 was, um, uh, uh, it was an airplane. So early 1930s, commercial aviation wasn't working very well. Um, the planes weren't good enough. People were losing money. Um, airplanes were crashing and um, it was, you know, everybody was innovating madly, but, but it wasn't working yet. And then Douglas Aircraft brings out the DC-3, and all of a sudden they sell close to 11,000 of these. Actually, 10,800, which is almost the same as the Arcana Celestia passages, which is kind of a really weird coincidence. <laughs> um, but... Uh, they, um, why? Why did suddenly the DC-3 work? And here are the answers, and this is not really part of the quiz, um, but there were eight innovations that once they all came together, the DC-3 became a reliable, fast, capable, safe airplane. And they sold like hot. only had seven of those things, it didn't work. If you had eight, it worked. So I think we're in a situation as a church, and, and the New Christian Bible Study project is in the same situation on a you know, smaller scale. Um, what are those innovations that need to be part of the package in order for this to go? So those are the two levels. Um, for New Christian Bible Study, one thing was realizing that nobody or hardly anybody is searching for the writings. They, most people haven't heard of Swedenborg um, and they're not searching for Arcana Celestia or, you know, the, the, just the key words that people search for, the writings aren't turning up. So if you look at the stat, it's small. But they are reading the word. So if we can say, all right, we're going to make and we should be able to do that as a church because we have the real meaning, then, then those hundreds of millions of people can find us and they will find us and we can introduce them to the internal sense. And so that's one innovation. Do Bible study. Don't expect people to search the writings. Um, because they just don't know. So that's one. Um, another one, and these sort of happened. We didn't, you know, we didn't know all this up front. We're kind of realizing these things as we're going along. And um, so that's what I just said. Uh, here's another one that I think is is important. Was that whole multilingual thing where um, we can't just be an English focused church. It's, it's not okay. You know, the Great Commission doesn't say go out and make disciples of one nation or something. You know, it's, it's not the way not the way we should do it. Um, a third one is, is explaining. So if you just show somebody the, the word things, um, it's a pretty significant learning curve. Just with vocabulary and with difficulty of, of language and, and sometimes chop. 
you could give people a nice explanation um, that gets, that's really got a lot of potency, I think. So that's another another one of those innovation factors. So that's kind of what we've been doing. I'm going to gears here for a second and show you the new Christian Bible study project. I don't know how much detail you'll be able to see, so I'm going to do that fast. But I'd like it if you guys would, you know, when you go home, go to newchristianbiblestudy.org and bookmark it and make it, you know, make it a favorite because it's, it's, um, it's fun. All right. So let's see. I have to to escape, I think, and F3 and pick this. All right. Um, this is our homepage. And um, if you scroll down, there are some pathways about spiritual topics. And these are things you can sort of dig into and get down to finer, finer level topics. We have Christmas featured right now, so there are our um, explanations about prophecy and a nice one about um, oh Andy yours is in here Andy did where are you there the betrothal you see this one that's a Henry also a Tanner picture that's down in the Philadelphia Art Museum and that's your betrothal article there um, and so we try to put together articles, things that are going to interest people. Um, sorry about the scrolling. The, mouse, the, the Mac actually scrolls the opposite direction from a PC. It's kind of interesting. So, um, the, let's see. You can read the word. And if this is really neat. So here we're in Genesis 1. If you say study the inner meaning, you get what we call the Bible slider. And it slides out and it shows you everywhere that the writings refer to Genesis 1. And it shows you a bunch of collateral literature about Genesis 1, including some um, of Jonathan Rose's Spirit and Life Bible study talks. It shows you parallel verses in the Word for Genesis 1. This is kind of neat. It shows you the the correspondence or the representation of keywords in the chapter in the order that they occur. So beginning and God and created and heavens. So you can pop those up. And it shows you videos that come from off the left eye that are indexed to... So if Curtis refers to Gen Genesis 1, we've got that data all stored in our database. And this is a sort of a strategic partnership with off the left eye. So that you know, reading Genesis 1, you get Curtis referring to Genesis 1, and it goes right to the place in the video where he refers to it. So it's, it's pretty cool. And then, um, what else do we have up there? Oh, we have the GC Ed resources. So all of the, um, and we worked with Digital Wave on this, Dave Cooper's right there, and also Sarah and her friends over at GC Ed. And, um, so we have all the GC Ed resources also cataloged for Genesis 1. Same for every chapter all the way through. So the Bible slider is a really rich source of stuff. Um, here, okay, this is one of the things I'm most excited about, is we have far and away the biggest collection of writings translations. We have 360 translations now in 21 languages, I think. And um, uh, it's, you know, this is one translation. So we have 360. Um, well, no, this is one translation of 30 works, so or 50 works. But so we've got, you know, six, seven times that in our system. So we've got French and German and Dutch and Czech and Swedish, some Swedish and Italian and Spanish and Portuguese and Korean and Japanese and Chinese and I'm forgetting some Zulu, you know, all sorts of neat stuff. So one of the big, big uh, 
I'm going to say that later. Never mind. Um, okay, let's look at a couple more things here. So if you're just reading the writings and you're reading, say, the Arcana, there it is, and you have what we call the writing slider. So study this passage. And here are any inbound references. So you've always been able to get outbound references, but these are passages that refer into this one. So that's kind of neat. And videos. So this is talking about the afterlife, and there's Curtis talking about the afterlife. So um, again, that, that cross-indexing, the cross-fertilization is really important. Um, what else? We have collateral literature. So those books of commentary, we have, I think, all of the commentary. Well, we have almost all of the commentary that's been done here. And it's, it's all incorporated. And some of it's been chopped up into chapter level stuff. Some of it hasn't. But it's, it's all here and it's searchable and referable. So if, um, let's see. Here's search. So you can search the word or the writings or explanations. So these are sermons or topical articles, that kind of thing. And you can choose your language. You can narrow down your search. You can search for exact phrases or this or that. You, you can get really fancy if you want to. Um, do some very, we, got, we support regular expressions so you can write the syntax. We've got some examples, but basically it's a very powerful search um, function. So that's all there too. All right, now, a um, couple other things. We have a map of the new church around the world. So we have churches and publishers and, and uh, schools and camps and that kind of thing. And we have contact information for all those flags. Um, what else? That's under, ooh, we'll go back to it. Sorry, I'm bad at this scrolling thing. There, this map. And then this is really neat. We have the interface in, in all those languages. So if you want to read uh, the writings or read the whole website in Korean, you can ask for the Korean, uh, the Korean, choose the Korean interface, and you can choose the Korean Bible, and you can read the writings in Korean. And what we really want is it to be so seamless that you don't even know you're on, a, on an English website. You're on a Korean website, and Japanese, and all of them. So, so I think that's going to be really important for people's comfort. OK, and then there's a bunch of stuff under the hood that I won't go into, but um, it's, it's all in this great big connected database, and it's really cool, and it does all kinds of whiz-bang things. And it's easy to maintain and make corrections, and it's great. OK, what do we got next? I need to go back to uh, switch back F3, back to slides. How am I doing on time, Brian? Am I OK? OK, good. So here, find a little button. OK, so yeah, traffic has gone really well. Um, and I think we can keep it going. There's, we still have to keep finding those innovations that are going to take us up successive notches. I don't think we're going to get it without doing more innovative stuff. But I think we can if we, if we keep innovating. Some of the things I think we need to do, <clears throat> well, first, we need to partner with people. Um, and we have been doing this. So all church branches. Um, because I think that's really important. They all face 
uh, similar challenges. The general church is the biggest and strongest, but um, but again, we're just just a drop in a very big bucket, and um, and the other churches have interesting footholds. Like you know, the Australians have footholds in Australia, and the General Conference still has footholds in places in England where we don't have something in the general church. The Lord's New Church is really interesting because they've got little toeholds in, in Ukraine and Serbia and Croatia and Netherlands and uh, Lesotho and places where, again, our footprint really isn't. So, um, so I think branch collaboration is really important. The publishers um, working closely with Swedenborg Foundation and sometimes Swedenborg Society too, everybody's been very generous about giving us permission to do stuff, which is great. Um, the Academy, we've, we've had a really productive uh, collaborative arrangement with that. I'll, I'll talk a bit, bit more about that. Translators, it's really fun to work with translators because we have, there are people all over the world that are translating the writings and, um, and we can make their lives easier and we can give them airtime, which, you know, they, they just haven't had. So they've, they've had these translations, but they're on these little teeny sites that get three people and, you know, it's, and so it's, it's great. And they're excited and we're excited. So. And ministers and bloggers and media people and off the left eye. So I'll, I'm going to, you know, sort of, iterate this a few times. I think this, well, there's lots of unifying and, and, and cross-connecting that we can do that's really important. Um, let's see. We talked, I don't think we need to probably go through that. Um, what, what a, a couple of things we're working on, I, I want to get chapter summaries um, for all the chapters in the Word. And um, I really hope the clergy will help do that. And um, we have maybe 180 clergymen, clergy people across the branches and um, 800 and some chapters. So it's four a piece. It takes a couple hours to write one or 10 or 12 hours if you're, if you're doing it the old way. But it's, um, if we could do that, I think that would be one of those innovations that gets us up another notch. Uh, let's see. We love volunteers. Um, have them doing a bunch of different things. What else? Here's, I think off the left eye, that collaboration is going to get closer and, um, and sort of richer. That's a, that's a really good thing. Um, groups, I think... So when people read and they um, they start to, you know, it resonates with them and they're reading more and pretty soon they want to talk to somebody about it. And yet, and we need to. And I has that same challenge. Um, the general church has that challenge. All the church branches have that challenge. Um, nobody's really mastered it yet. I think we might do something pretty interesting because the churches could, you know, they they could staff, they could lead some of those groups because we don't have the staff to do it. Um, so we could get the people and off the left eye can get the people, but then people that need a deep dive need to come here to the academy and take seminars and classes and online courses and retreats and, and you know, charges. <laughs> and um, I think online groups, and I, I think the churches could lead those. And, um, and then I think also, uh, what was I going to say? Churches. Oh, just, just the... You know, it needs. I think it needs a common infrastructure. So we build, build a set of things, and then you people this. So I think this can happen. I think it can really work. But I think all the parties need to work together. Okay. 
this is basically, again, what I just said. I think this will eventually uh, revive congregations, too. We had, this was fun, yesterday I was ushering at Pittsburgh New Church, and a lady uh, came just at the very, you know, just last minute, came in and uh, with her son, and I didn't know her, you know, gave her a pamphlet and showed her where to sit and got her a songbook, and, and um, afterwards she came out and I struck up a conversation and she's a social worker at UPMC and she wanted to find our church because she'd been listening to Curtis's videos and she was so excited and she had to come find her church and she wants to come with her mom and her sister. So, you know, if we can do that kind of thing with, with these big funnels of Bible and spiritual seekers and, and then bring them into some focused things, uh, here in the academy and in local congregations, I think we've got a shot. So, um, again, these are the partnerships. Uh, something I, I really like what Brian has done with, have you heard of the Institute for Swedenborg Studies at all? Hasn't been a whole lot about it yet, but um, we're, we're, there's, the college is working on setting up the Institute for Swedenborg Studies, which is is designed really for continuing education and for non, you know, you're not there to get a four-year degree, you're there to learn. And you might get credits, the Mars program might be part of it, but it's also, and Grant is, where's Grant? Grant's doing uh, an initial not-for-credit course coming up soon, I think it's going to be available in the spring. and. Um, you know, it's it's a really neat thing, but again, it's we're we're trying to bring these parties together to collaborate on making the structure for it, and I think it's got a lot of potential. So those are some of the things I think that um, come to the site, poke around. If you want to help, you can proofread, you can make corrections, you can write chapter summaries, you can find interesting illustrations for spiritual concepts. There are all kinds of fun. If we crowdsource it, um, I, I think it could actually be a thing for the church, for the people of the church to be involved in this kind of thing. And it's set up for that. So, so check it out and give me a call and say, hey, I'd like to do this. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So, happy to take questions. Is there a format for that, Christine? That, um, here's one. I'm a techno-toddler. I don't know how to come to the site. I tried the way that I find Bible study, and I can't find you. So, if you go to newchristianbiblestudy.org on a web browser, you should find it, and and it works nicely on a phone. It works nicely on a iPad. Martha Osblund is a skilled iPad user, and a, and she's a frustrated software designer because um, <laughs> she she tells me what I need to do better, which is actually really useful. I'm really curious about um, online audiences. Mm -hmm. um, having um, worked closely with the uh, Swedenborg Foundation and Off the Left Eye, and I'm just wondering if you've found any studies out there that actually show what the crossover between an online seeker is to one that actually wants to show up in a small group, like it. it is there data out there that that says that that's true? And, you know, we perceive that, yeah. we think that that would be true, but I'm curious as to whether there's any data out there about that. Not, not much, and I haven't really done that research. But from what um, we're seeing people popping up now and saying, is there a group near me? And we didn't see that right away, and that was kind of scary. You know, so why aren't you know why aren't we seeing it? Um, but it's happening now, and I think as we get better at um, 
for a long time we were in shelf stocking mode. You know, we're putting writings in there and we're putting the word in there and we weren't really very good yet at, at the interface and at explanations. Um, we're seeing people sticking around longer and doing more, sort of getting more involved and I think, and I don't know, I don't have the data, but I think that the next step, and, and Curtis, those guys, with some success, and they're doing a thing here at the college uh, in June, is it, right? Um, that I think they've got you know, 40 people signed up for, something like that now, and it's not bad for December, so. Um, so I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I, I don't really know the answer, but I'm hopeful. <laughs> Just on that other one, I, I just looked up New Christian Bible Study, mm -hmm. and it says this somebody's stealing it. This connection is not private. This website may be impersonating www. Uh, somebody's impersonating you. Um, Are you aware of that? I doubt it because I'm on it right there, right now. Well, here it is, and okay. it says you can't you can't get it. Um, so somebody's, and it says these people may be stealing your personal and financial information. You should go back to the previous page. Does anybody else replicate that? Yeah, so here it is. I wonder if you've got something misspelled. I, I just did New Christian Bible Study. And that's what I got. Home page. And this is your home page. So you need to be aware somebody's stealing you. I wonder what can be done about that. Um, I think it's, I don't think anybody's stealing us. Um, the, That's the first time I've ever run into that. Yeah. I don't want to try and do tech support for you here live, but I'll take a look later. Um, what? You're, you're all right? Yeah, I think it's okay. I mean, I'm, it's, it's okay up here. But it may be, Tom may have a security setting where, um, yeah. It's difficult for this network. Right. I think it's yeah, it's probably the, the Wi Fi here. Um it's like a security setting to say, we don't know that this is a good thing. So it's another place. Yep, so then just click on it and say I'm willing to take the risk. Um Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um I have two questions. One is um do you do advertising on your site? We have not. No advertising whatsoever, because no. that can be very significant. Yeah. Um, the other question I have is, how would you characterize your main goal? As an ideological goal or as an institutional goal? What is your main site goal? Is it ideological or institutional? Institutional. Can I have a third alternative? Sure. I mean, what, go ahead. I'd uh, interested. Maybe it's ideological. I, I want to. Um, I want to make a site that. Well, not even want to make a site. I want the people in the world to have, the chance to. Uh, to get to know and understand new church, the new Christian church. And um, I think that a really fruitful way to do it is through the in using the internal sense as the gateway to, to that knowledge. Because one of the things that's really striking about the writings is, is how many, many, many scripture references Swedenborg makes. And it's a very, very biblical church. And um, I think that gives us a really strong case to make if we, if we make it. So. I guess I'd say ideological, yeah. Or I don't know. Sorry, Christine's running the show. <laughs> um, this is awesome. I weirdly and surprised that I haven't used it more than I have already. Um, so thank you for sharing it. And I guess I'm curious to know, only because I 
currently have a Bible study app on my phone that is not a New Church Bible study app. And whether New Christian Bible study has plans to launch an app, um, just because I know, at least for me and maybe other people of my generation, something we I look for is a way to prompt that time in my day to be reading. It might not necessarily be a habit already. Um, and if I find a text or something I love, whether there's a way for that text or um, institution to help me build that habit. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. We do have, okay, we have an app. Um, and just, just to clarify, you can use this on your smartphone anytime you're connected to the web. So if you have Wi-Fi or, or um, you know, a, to be connected um, because some of the places, for example, in West Africa and in Cuba, uh, they don't have reliable connections at all. And um, so we made an app, but it's still somewhat limited. It has, it doesn't have the Bible and it's just got one translation of each work, published work of the writings. And it's searchable and it's navigable, but it's it's um, so I, I don't think it's a good replacement, but it's a good place if you're, you know, if you're going to be off the grid, it's a good thing. But the reminders, actually, I think I think that's something we could do better. We do have reading plans, and they will remind you every day um, to to read the next step of your reading plan. Um, but I'd like to do something like the General Church does with Daily Inspiration. Um, Guy in Holland does the same thing. Uh, Hus Janssens does a sort of a Daily Inspiration for the Dutch-speaking world. And I think we should do something like that. It'd be good. So. Uh, two questions. One, I'm, I'm just aware um, Jörn Apgren was talking about some of the older Swedish translations. And he said, well, that would be like an English person trying to read Canterbury Tales in the original, whatever it is, Middle English. It's just out of date, but you've got pretty good confidence that their translations are reasonably up to date? Yes. Good. And in, how in about a word, but, but not, not universally. I mean, um, yeah. some of the Russian stuff, I understand, is kind of old-fashioned. Some of the Swedish is they're, uh, they're trying to bring it up to date. Can I, can I go on a little tangent for a second? Sure, sure. So one of the things that's really exciting right now is, is AI, machine, machine translation. And up until recently, it was not very good. It's getting really good really fast. And, um, and it's sort of human, human attended machine translation. So you say, here are a bunch of here are a bunch of English source documents, and here's some French ones that I that I I think are good. And can you study that and study this machine and learn it, and then then translate this into this? And then the machine does it; it learns all that stuff, and then you start to fix it. So when you're fixing Genesis, you're fixing a lot of stuff, but in Exodus it's a little better. And by the time you're in Deuteronomy, it's pretty good. And your you know New Testament is like whoa, you know it's doing it. And I'm exaggerating, but they're seeing like tripling of translator productivity in this thing, and it's. Um, I, mean, I think there's enormous potential for a tiny church to have huge leverage that, with that. And I, I really want to make a new church translation of the word. And oh, I didn't show you the Kempton project. We have the Kempton pro translation just as of last week, um, which is really cool. And if we use that as the basis for. Um, if we say translate into 25 target languages um, to cover most of the world based from a good new church translation and then we get translators to improve those we could be you know we could uh, I just think it, it would be another thing that one of those innovation waves it would just take us up up, up. 
Well, that's what if you've got somebody to look over it. Uh, was yes, it a funky absolutely. little museum that clearly had used artificial intelligence to produce English yes. things that right. went right. Oops. And there's a whole there's a whole yeah. bunch of funny <laughs> uh, funny T-shirts you see in Thailand or whatever that, that don't make any sense. Right. Kind of thing, so. Do you have metrics so. on where people are entering and how yes. they're moving from places and what's that showing you? It's interesting. They don't come to the home page by and large. Search is probably is a is a pretty big entry page, but they come to Bible chapters, Bible verses, um, and and there's a fairly Pareto effect, you know, common ages like John 3:16 gets lots of you know traffic, and and um, um, so we could, if we were writing commentary, you know, we could do it based on popularity of of page traffic, and you know, write the write the summaries of the most popular chapters first, and that would be a, a good way to do it. So. Um, I have two questions. The first is, you often say the word, but I assume you have the whole Bible there. It depends on the translation, but yes. Okay. Um, like the Kempton translation would just be the New Church Canon. Yeah. Um, some we only have a New Testament. Uh, it depends on the language and the translation, but, but yeah, most of them... You, you know, there are, I think, seven or eight different accepted Christian canons. Which is, which is just like, and the numbering, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you think you've got it figured out, and it's, like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But um, mostly we have standardized on the, the English chaptering, English numbering, um, and uh, most of the translations include non canonical works from our standpoint. Okay, thanks. So. And the second question is um, do you have? links to print sermons, I mean online, but not just audio links to sermons? We have print sermons. We have links to text, sermon text, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, how far back do you, I mean, you know, is it like, oh, is it we all have about 9,000 explanations. Um, I don't know how far back they go, but, mm. um, but we don't have, uh, we don't get a regular sermon feed that would be another nice thing to get where where um, where every week we got you know 50 more sermons um. okay. so um, you may have touched on this a little bit in your last couple questions but um, when people are looking and doing those you know three million or however many 150 million um, searches on Bible study sites do you have ways of finding what they're searching for most? I mean, so that you can be reacting to that or, or, yeah. or thinking about those areas first, like you're saying about John 3.16. Um, those 150 million aren't searches, those are visits. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, you can get some data on what for. Just because it seems like an interesting opportunity where uh, there are a lot of faiths that are very Bible-based, and yet, I just having recently seen a conversation with someone who was saying, you know, that we are not Bible-based, yeah. and feeling like, well, we're absolutely Bible-based. And how do you sort of, since you're going through the letter of the word being what people are searching for and looking for, there are so many Bible sites out there that do have commentary or um, opinions on what people are reading, and even Bibles you can buy that have notes and notes and notes and notes that are all collateral so it's not an unknown thing and it's not actually I mean that's all Bible based in people's minds so I feel like that is a an interesting sort of way to reach people because they're already doing that kind of thing so yeah, they really I mean the idea of commentary is a very widely held idea you know people expect that I think something you know I talk about study site I think we Teacher, and then also have, you know, the real internal sense. Um, so, sorry, there's Christina or Nina. I don't know or Andy. So, did that? Okay. Sorry, five. Okay. We've got Andy and um, Nina and Martha. So. 
Yeah, thank you. Do you have any idea where these three million people are in the world? Are you able to tr uh, track their, their demographics? So we do. We know geographically where they are. Um, it's, it's primarily English language traffic still, although, you know, substantial chunks of other stuff. Um, the U.S., uh, the Philippines, get a lot of traffic from the Philippines. Um, and that is, I mean, it's pretty clearly Catholic traffic. You know, it's going to, going to pay, to, and, and like on, on Philippine holidays, you'll see a spike of, 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 of Filipino traffic to, to some certain pages. And that's an interesting one because we don't have any Tagalog. Uh, we, there are a couple of little groups in the Philippines that I, I'd like to go sort of talk to somehow and, and get some more Tagalog. We have, I think, one, one article in Tagalog, and that's it. We have a Tagalog Bible, and they go there. Um, we have, uh, there's also interesting traffic from like Saudi Arabia and, and places, but I think that might be guest workers, Christian guest workers in, in some of the Middle Eastern countries and things. So it's a big mix. I would like to be, um, like we're weak in Spanish, I'd really like to do more with Spanish. Um, and um, one reason I think, talking about the, the Bible, making more translations of the Bible, is a lot of our Bible translations that we offer are old. And it gets, getting back to Eric's thing, where you know, if you've got an older translation, people aren't really going to want, they're not going to want to read it. So if we could get a fresh new translation in each one, but we can't get the permission to do it um, from, you know, can't get the copyright to do it. So we need, maybe we need to make our own in some cases. And I think that would be a kind of a neat project. So. You were talking about connecting with the different organizations and you said you had a thing with the ANC that you would tell us about later. I, I just was wondering if you, like, are the students yeah. using it for assignments? The students do use it. Um, they, uh, uh, Grant, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> uh, Mike's over here. Grant said uh, his Religion 225 class uses it all the time. Um, we're, so, yeah, I think the students are using it. Um, and I think also just sort of strategically, I want to work with with, with Brian and, and his whole team and make sure that it's not just the students using it as a reference. They could also work. There's lots of student work that could be done. One of the things I think would be cool um, is something that, that Dick Brickman suggested was, hey, you know, I'm having trouble with this on my, on my iPad. Can you send a student over to help me out? Mm -hmm. And, you know, wouldn't that be neat if we had a little, a little you know, group of students that could, could go to Camwood Village and say, all right, you know, we're gonna we're gonna show you how to do this. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for music, art, computer science, uh, writing, religion, um, language. I mean, you know, all over the college, there are opportunities for that kind of thing. So. I, I told my high school kid I was coming here, and and I said, well, there's this website, and and he knows you, and and when I said you make that website, he. His eyebrows went up a oh, little good. bit. <laughs> I just would like to speak as an older person. Uh, all my life, or for a, a long time, I did my reading out of books. But when my eyes got old, I had to transfer to the New Church Bible Study, where I could read, and I could make the print bigger. And I find... I love the idea of having students or college people come and help older folks because my friends, or uh, some of them, just don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But it is a wonderful thing, and I heartily thank you, Steve, for developing the program. Great. <laughs> Good. All right. yeah.